This past year, the Christian rock band Petra had a mini miniature or a, real, a short-term 50th anniversary, anniversary tour. They're no longer touring as a band, but the band got together to celebrate this milestone, and we might call it a geriatric tour because they're all in their mid-70s now, and they're still trying to do the music. And they, and they had these concerts throughout the country. I didn't know anything about them, but a friend of mine was at the one in Nashville, Tennessee, and he live-streamed some of it, so I got to hear some of the concert and got to hear all the old songs that they used to sing and uh, enjoy that. And in between one of the songs, Bob Hartman, the guitar player, the lead guitar player, the founder of the band, uh, began to share uh, some, some of his heart and his concern for the state of the church. And he said, I, I wonder if the Lord is going to say to us one day, you only had one assignment. You just had one assignment. He's speaking about the Great Commission to make disciples. And, and it's true, isn't it, that the church often does lose sight of this assignment and either just goes through the motions or is concerned with a lot of peripheral concerns and not the commission that Jesus gave us. So unfortunately, that's true. And this sermon series has been about refocusing on that call, has been about uh, realigning our hearts and minds with God's will and purposes and what he wants to do through his church. And I hope you don't take his comment as a guilt trip. I don't think he meant it that way. And hopefully you don't take any of the things that I've said over these last several weeks in that way. But we do need to grapple with this, this fact that there is a call and responsibility laid upon the church by Jesus to go and make disciples. And perhaps it's best to hear that commission in the context in which it was given. And I think this will give us some great encouragement and hope this morning to realize the circumstances that compel and the reason for this commission. We find our text in Matthew chapter 28, verses 1 to 10 to begin with. This is the word of the Lord. After the Sabbath, as the first day of the week was dawning, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went to see the tomb. And suddenly there was a great earthquake, for an angel of the Lord, descending from heaven, came and rolled back the stone and sat on it. His appearance was like lightning, and his clothing was white as snow. For the fear of him, the guard shook and became like dead men. But the angel said to the women, don't be afraid. I know you're looking for Jesus who was crucified. He's not here. For he has been raised, as he said. Come see the place where he lay. Then go quickly and tell his disciples that he's been raised from the dead. And indeed, he is going ahead of you to Galilee. And there you will see him. This message is for you. So they left the tomb quickly with fear and great joy, and ran to tell his disciples, when suddenly Jesus met them and said, Greetings. And they came to him and took hold of his feet and worshipped him. And then Jesus said to them, Don't be afraid. Go and tell my brothers to go to Galilee. There they will see me. The word of the Lord. In the few days prior to this, of course, Jesus had been handed over to be uh, crucified to, to the Roman authorities by the Jewish religious leaders. But Acts 2.23 says that it was actually also God's deliberate plan and foreknowledge, Acts 2.23, that Jesus was put to death by being nailed to the cross. And he was buried. And as we sometimes sing, lo, in the grave he lay, Jesus our Savior. And the religious leaders uh, requested that the tomb be guarded by soldiers because they remembered that that man had said that he would be raised from the dead on the third day, and they didn't want the disciples going and stealing the body and giving some kind of false report. So they requested that soldiers be posted, and they were, and the stone of the tomb was sealed. They thought they had, they, they thought they had it figured out. They, they thought they could stop what was going to happen. The women observed all this, all his death, all his suffering, stood there at the cross on a distance, watching what had happened. 
And they go early on the first day of the week, Sunday, as another act of devotion to Jesus. They want to care for his body with spices and things we learn from other Gospels. And, and the other Gospels also reveal, as they go, they're wondering, who in the world is going to remove this stone from the tomb for us? Because they wouldn't be able to do it. Who's going to be doing it for us? And when Mary, Magdalene, and Mary and the other Gospels record that other women are also there, they, they see that that's not going to be a problem because an angel has removed the stone and is sitting on top of it. An angel has removed it. And the guards who are supposed to secure this, this tomb are shaking in their boots, not because of the earthquake, but because of the angel and what they're seeing. But the angel has a message for the women. This, it's interesting, isn't it, that just as angels announce the birth of Jesus, now an angel is going to announce the resurrection of Jesus to these women. To these lowly shepherds, they were told, uh, the angels foretold his birth, and now an angel is going to announce his resurrection to women, which is amazing because in that culture, the witness of women was as good as nothing. But things are different in the kingdom of God. And so if the gospel writers were trying to get a false report going, they would have never recorded this part, that the women are told about the resurrection, or that they would be the ones who would carry that witness with them. The angel affirms that they're at the right tomb as well. This is not somebody else, else's tomb. They weren't mistaken. No, this is Jesus' tomb. And he says, but he's not here. I know you're looking for Jesus who was crucified, but he's not here. In fact, come and see where he lay, just so you can see that the tomb is empty. And they go and see. And he says, I have an assignment for you. Go and tell the disciples, that Jesus has been raised from the dead and he's going to meet them in Galilee. Go tell them to get ready to meet me on the mountain. They're given this assignment. They have been told that Jesus has been raised from the dead. And notice they go quickly, they go immediately to do this. And they go in haste. And what's so beautiful here is that Mary Magdalene and Mary uh, here in the Gospel of Matthew, other women are with them, of course, we know. But they, they uh, received something that the angel didn't mention anything about. They were told to go with this assignment to the other disciples. But on their way, Jesus himself meets them and greets them and reveals himself to them that he is indeed risen from the dead. Isn't that beautiful? Not only are they told by the angel that he's been risen from the dead, that he's risen, but now he himself is standing there and greeting them, and they, gl they glass on and hold on to his, onto his feet as, as to never let him go again. And they worship Jesus. So now, not only do they have this assignment from the angel and this, and this message from the angel that Jesus is raised from the dead, now they themselves have encountered the risen Christ. So not only do they have the message, they have their own report that Jesus is truly alive. And the empty tomb and the fact that they hold on to his feet Show us that this is a bodily resurrection as ours will be when he comes again. Clasping at the feet of Jesus in worship. That's a pretty good description of what's happening with the revival in Kentucky. I, uh, if you haven't heard, it's been mentioned this morning, but after a regularly scheduled chapel service on Wednesday, February 8th, some students lingered to pray after the service. And soon they were the recipients of an outpouring of Jesus' presence and love. And ever since then, it has been ongoing worship and prayer and confession of sin, very raw and vulnerable testimonies. There's a lot of, a lot, a lot of them were talking about being abused uh, physically and sexually, a lot of anxiety and depression. Just They were just pouring this out to total strangers, a lot of them. All these testimonies, this repentance, this confession of sin as well, these messages, the scripture readings, this, uh, this worship ongoing ever since then. And thousands have been going. Of course, you know that I went this week, Tuesday through Thursday, came back Thursday. But I want to tell you that this isn't a, a, a revival or an outpouring or an awakening, whatever you want to assign 
whatever name you want to uh, assign to it because a lot of people are going. That's not why it, we, we would call it that. They're calling it an outpouring of Jesus' love and presence. But that's not why, just because people are showing up. That's not the reason. The reason is that, that the Lord himself has, has made himself known in a real way. And so people are coming to seek him with all their heart. The same Holy Spirit there is, is here with us. But the Lord does move in these particular ways at particular times and places. And what's, being, what's happened, I think, here is that many who have come are being reminded that we serve a living Savior. That's what they're being reminded of, that we serve a living Savior. It's not just uh, someone that was recorded in the history books, although that's true. This is somebody that still lives, is raised from the dead, is risen. Did you notice that? He is risen, not, not just raised from the dead as if he died again, but he is risen right now. And that's what they're learning now. That's what they're being reminded of, that Jesus is alive. That's what they're being reminded of. And experiencing this outpouring of Jesus' presence and love is a reminder that Jesus is a love is, is alive, and they are encountering the living Christ. That's, that's the reality. That's the truth. That's what's inspiring all the worship and the praise. That's what's re- inspiring the repentance and the recommitment and the confession of sin and the ministry to one another and, and uh, all that's happening. Jesus is alive. I would tell you as of Wednesday, 20 college campuses have sent students to come to Asbury to share in what's happening, and six schools have gone to all-day prayer as a result. And that's just so far. Why? I would suggest to you because people are encountering the risen Christ. They're being reminded again and experiencing the truth and the reality of that Jesus is alive. The university president, Kevin Brown, says that what's happening can't be reduced to just sociological explanations. This is the work of God. This is a fresh encounter with our living Lord. Let me just share one brief example of this and relate it to here what's happening in our text this morning. I witnessed uh, firsthand the testimony of Delorgis Delorgis is his name. It was a hard name to get, but I heard it several times, so I wrote it down and made sure I tried to get the pronunciation right. He's an international student from Brazil, and he had been an Asbury student. He had graduated in December, and he was sharing his testimony Tuesday night, and he was sharing about how it had been a a very difficult several months for him, very lonely several months because he's away from all his family in Brazil. He didn't have them to lean on. Yes, they can do phone calls and video things, but it's not the same thing as being there with them when they can get together. So he's been very, very lonely, and it's been a very difficult season for him. And he hasn't gotten a job either after he graduated in December. But he was actually glad about that because he, he thought, well, maybe I would have not been here for all that's happening. And he was going to be asked to pray for the nations as an international student, to pray for the other nations, that God would bring renewal and revival to them as well. And and before he was going to pray, though, somebody in the balcony over here said, Hey, you! Hey, you! Come here! And he went over, and the man crumpled up a $20 bill and threw it on the stage. And the Lord just thanked him for that, and as he was walking, and ba- walking back, dozens of other people started coming and putting money on the platform for Delorges. Uh, all kinds of, I don't know how many people, I kind of lost track. People stood up in front of me. I couldn't see all that was happening. But dozens of people, and he was like, no, no, please don't, please don't, please don't. But dozens of people came and put money on the stage for him. And he began to break down in tears. Remember, he didn't get a job yet. He was in need. He didn't know what he was going to do. And a couple of the university uh, leaders there came around him and began to pray for him. And they began to affirm and encourage him and said, the Lord just, this is the way, this is one way the Lord is showing you that he's going to provide for you. 
You have a call in your life and he's going to make a way for that to happen. And if it's here or somewhere else or in Brazil that you would go and preach the gospel, we know that you will preach it and he is reaffirming his call in your life and he's providing for you. The next morning, they announced that over $6,000 was given for DeLorges to provide for him. It was a radical display of generosity and something he'll never forget. It's not a coincidence then that the next night there was a group from Brazil who came with a Brazilian flag and they came to the altar and put that flag on it, asking the Lord to bring revival to their country. It's just one example of what's happening there. And isn't it, um, isn't it just an example of God's graciousness and goodness. Just think about this, all this after COVID, after all those restrictions about how many could be there. Now that auditorium, every seat is filled. Now there's, there's three overflow places that, that are largely filled as well. And there's a screen set up outside for people to watch the simulcast of what's happening. All these people now are experiencing the presence of our living Lord and it's spreading to other places as well. And that's the way it's supposed to be. Because notice what happens with the women in our text. They're not permitted to hold on to him indefinitely. They're reminded of the assignment they've been given. That they need to go and tell the disciples to meet Jesus in Galilee. And what's happening in Asbury won't, be, won't last forever either. It's not, it'll, it's not indefinite. It's, it's, a, it's, it's, it's up to the Lord, but it won't, it's not sustainable and it's not meant to be the president mentioned. Just like the, the disciples on the Mount of Transfiguration, they after that time went down the mountain back to find that the disciples couldn't cast out a demon. And in the same way here, the women are told of the assignment that they have. They've encountered the living Christ. Now the assignment is to go tell the disciples what had happened. And that's what they do. Look at verses 16 through 20. They had obviously done that because now the 11 disciples went to Galilee to the mountain which Jesus had directed them. And when they saw him, they worshiped him, but some doubted. And Jesus came and said to them, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I've commanded you. And remember, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. We, we learn from Acts chapter 1, if you turn there, or, or uh, Luke chapter 24 as well, or especially Acts chapter 1, that Jesus appeared to his disciples after his resurrection over the course of 40 days. And he taught them about the kingdom of God. And he gave them convincing proofs that he's alive. This is one of them here on the, on the mountain here with the disciples. But these encounters with the living Christ aren't just the, meant to be these exhilarating uh, experiences that they'll cherish. It means that they are now witnesses of his resurrection and they're sent to go with this assignment to tell other people and not just other people, but to bring that message to the rest of the entire world. So it's not just, a, just, not, not just a mountaintop experience with Jesus, the risen Christ. It is, it is something that they'll cherish. But now that they've encountered the risen Christ, they are reminded too of their assignment or given their assignment in this case to go and make disciples of all nations. R.T. France says, many who claim that they had seen Jesus alive from the dead indicate a significant conversation with him rather than a fleeting appearance and they were so sure that they devoted their lives to proclaiming what they had seen and some died for it clearly their testimony was not fabricated in other words the truth that Jesus is alive is what compels the commission is the reason for the commission so it's it's a uh, it's so much better than oh this is some guilt trip of what you need to do this is what you should do. Why don't you, just, why don't you just go on and do it? Why aren't you doing it? Or something done out of some kind of a duty. No, Jesus is alive. That's the reason for the commission. 
Jesus is alive. That's the reason for the commission. And I'm convinced that one of the purposes God sends revival is to awaken the church from her slumber, to see the harvest fields of lost and broken people, and to send them out again to participate in his mission in the world. Notice the commission itself given to the disciples and to the church. Because Jesus is alive, all authority has been given to him under heaven and earth. And so he tells them, go and make disciples. Here's how it is on our back, back uh, bulletin board. The Father sent the Son. The Father and Son sent the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Triune God sends the church into the world as his witnesses. Look at the command to go. It's given fur further clarification in Acts chapter 1, verse 8. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. Wherever you go, take this message with you. Wherever you go, make disciples. So the message is, of the gospel is for those far away and those nearby. Or as one song puts it, for those across the street and those around the world. The gospel message is for those in Brazil and those in Wilmore, Kentucky. The gospel message is for those in Grandview and Belton or wherever we live and for those in Romania and in all the nations. This is a message for every person that is alive or will be alive, that Jesus is alive and to make disciples of him. That's the assignment. We're not making disciples of us or the church of the Nazarene. We are making disciples of Jesus Christ. This includes, of course, decisions made for Christ, the work of God in a person's life, that they would receive all that he's done for them. It starts there. A person must be born again. A person must respond to Jesus' gracious invitation to follow him. The atoning death of Christ must be applied to their heart and life for the forgiveness of sins. That's part of what it means to make a disciple. And then he says they must be baptized. Baptize them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. And we just re, uh, reviewed some of this in, in November when Suzanne and Gary were baptized. It's a mark of our inclusion in the new covenant in Christ. It's a mark of ownership. God says you belong to me. It is, a, it is a participation in the resurrected life of Christ and an identification with the death of Christ. All that baptism means is being communicated here uh, with this command to baptize. And on Easter Sunday, we'll be having another baptism service. And if you've never been baptized and you confess Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, you're invited to be baptized in that service. We'll have some preparation for you to to, uh, to do, and or if you would now receive Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, you would be invited to be baptized in that service. A disciple, however, is also called to learn a new way of life. Not just a one-time decision to follow after Jesus. It means to actually follow him. It means to learn from him, to come to him for salvation, but also to learn from him a new way of life, a kingdom way of life. And we are to teach every disciple to obey Jesus' teaching. <laughs> the responsibility of the church is to walk with new believers and teach them what Jesus taught. And this requires an ongoing relationship with, with them. It requires ongoing fellowship with them to teach them. And recently we've been giving some more attention to this and we'll continue to do, the, do that. So this assignment that the church has been given is our assignment until the end of the age. It won't be completed until then. It's not like, okay, we're done now. We've reached uh, uh, enough people. Uh, okay, we've reached a couple people. That's great. I think we can, we can sit back. No, that's the assignment ongoing until the end of the age. But it's an assignment too big for us. There's no way that we can carry this out. And I'm not talking about because we're a smaller church. I'm talking about because out of our own resources, there's no way we can accomplish this. But did you notice that Jesus gives them a promise? Jesus says, I will be with you always, even to the end of the age. That's how long we have until that assignment is completed. And Jesus is promising to be with them and us until that time 
comes. He's going to be with us. The message puts it, I will be with you as you do this day after day after day after day right up until the end of the age. In fact, that promise bookends the Gospel of Matthew. At his birth, Jesus is called Emmanuel, God with us. And now Jesus is promising his church, I will be with you always, even to the end of the age. And we know that that happens even though Jesus ascended to heaven through the person and ministry of the Holy Spirit who helps us and reminds us of everything that Jesus taught, confirms, us, confirms in us the message about Jesus and empowers us to fulfill this commission. As we sang this morning, the Holy Spirit will have to fit the church to meet this hour. That's a pretty good promise. They're all good, aren't they? But this, this one is a really good promise. It, 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 uh, it ministers to, a lot of, to us in a lot of different ways, but here it's meant to communicate that he's going to help us with the mission we've been given, the assignment we've been given. So here's how I'd like to put it today. And I hope you'll receive this. Through the revivals and outpourings and awakenings, he makes us more aware of his presence. And he's done that even for us this morning. He, he, he does that for us, and we need those times. But when the mountaintop times are over, the promise of his ongoing presence remains. Because it's based on his faithfulness, not in our perceptions of whether he's with us or not, not on our feelings or emotions, but on the basis of his faithfulness, he says he will never leave us or forsake us. To relate that to the mission again, R.T. France says, teaching them to obey the commandments Jesus has given his disciples throughout the gospel is, the on, is ongoing and relates to the nurture of Christians. As the disciples perform this missionary work, they can be assured of the continuing continuous presence of the resurrected Christ. Jesus will be with his disciples to help them, listen, overcome all the obstacles that stand in the way of fulfilling the mission. I would invite the musicians to come this morning. And as we sing this song, He Lives, I, it was my prayer last night, and it continues to be my prayer, that we will have a fresh encounter with the risen Lord. That we would be reminded, oh yeah, He is alive. We do serve a risen Savior. So when we sing that, that this would be a time that we could be reminded and that we would truly experience that He is present with us right now, just as He said He promised. But even if we don't feel anything, guess what? The promise is still true. But I do pray that we would have a fresh encounter, that he is alive. And perhaps you would want to come to these altars of prayer and linger here and allow the gentle shepherd to minister to the needs of your heart or to just be in his presence and worship him and give him thanks no matter what the circumstances are. And you would want to come and just worship him this morning because he is alive and he is present in your life. If you know Jesus Christ, he is with you right now. And the Holy Spirit dwells in us right now. I would also invite us and remind us that, that part of what we're asking the Lord to do is to revive us in the sense that we would be reminded of our need for Him to carry out this assignment. That the Holy Spirit would remind us of that, but also that He would begin to show us how He wants to equip us and to invite us into uh, that mission and assignment that he has for us. So I'd invite you to stand and we're going to sing this song together to worship him, to declare our need for him, and to ask him to help us with the assignment that he's given to us. Let's sing this together.